This lecture will begin by talking about active transport, both primary and secondary. We'll then get into the, into the idea of receptors, membrane receptors. We'll talk about uh, several different types, receptor channels, and then receptors that use second messengers, like receptor enzymes and G-protein coupled receptors. We'll then talk about some uh, types of cell communication, uh, both short range and long range methods. And then we'll get into the idea of membrane potential, which will be very useful for our next unit, which will be the nervous system. We'll talk about what voltage is, what happens when ions cross membranes and what other factors affect them other than diffusion. We'll then talk about electrochemical potential and the idea of equilibrium potential. Let's talk about active transport. So in the last lecture, we talked about passive transport. This time, let's go with active. So the thing about passive transport was that it required the cell to use no energy, but it always, overall, worked in the direction of in diffusion, things going from high to low concentration overall, and in osmosis, water going toward the higher osmolarity overall. 100% of the time, that's the way it works. If you want to move a solute against its concentration gradient from low to high concentration, you must always use energy in some way to do it. This is related to the idea of entropy, and we mentioned that in a previous lecture, that one of the laws of thermodynamics is that the total amount of disorder in the universe must always increase. Things being more concentrated here and less concentrated there is an ordered situation. There's, some, there's a level of order in that, whereas things being randomly distributed is disordered. Things will always go toward more disorder overall unless you use energy to sort them out. You may have noticed it's always easier for things to get messy than clean. That's one of the reasons. That, and if in an earthquake, there's enough energy out there to knock things back up on the shelves in addition to knocking them out. And yet it always seems to work knocking off the shelves. It's kind of a related idea. But going back to this. So you may, if, you're, if you see something moving from low to high concentration overall, energy is being used in some kind of active transport. So let's talk about that. So if I've got a cell and I've got a higher concentration inside than outside, and the movement is in this direction toward the higher concentration, some kind of active transport is being used there. Energy is being used. But active transport comes in a couple of types, primary and secondary. In primary active transport, energy is used at the site of transport. The most common version of this is where you have some sort of transport protein that uses energy to move things across the membrane against their concentration gradient. So this is usually this is usually being transported through some sort of active transport protein. Now of the transport proteins we talked about, channels and carriers, channels cannot be active transport. Channels are always passive transport. So this will be some kind of carrier. But it could be a uniport, an antiport, or a symport. Although off the top of my head, I don't think I've ever heard of an active symport. There's no reason there couldn't be one. Now, we should talk a little bit about the way in which these use energy. And in virtually all cases, this uses the energy source of ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. We even mentioned that in a previous lecture. That's the nucleotide adenosine, which is an adenine and the ribose sugar, with three phosphates rather than just one. So it's phosphate, 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 ribose, adenine. That's ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And the reaction that we get is ATP gets broken up into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates, plus PI, which stands for inorganic phosphate, the third phosphate. That's this going to this. 
So we took that bond there and broke it. Breaking off that third phosphate. That breaking that bond releases the energy. And we, let me just take a moment to talk about why that works, because that was confusing for me until someone finally explained it. This reaction can go the other way. You can take ADP plus phosphate and make them into ATP. That's what we use glucose metabolism for. But think about what that involves. So if I've got an ADP, that's an adenine, the ribose, and two phosphates. Now remember, those phosphates carry negative charge. So if I'm bringing in another phosphate with a negative charge, does it want to get anywhere near those other negative charges? Remember, like charges repel. So when I try to bring this phosphate in, it doesn't want to be there. Those both negative charge things push each other away. When I was a kid, I did this all the time. You may do it too. When you get two magnets and you put them with the same poles toward each other, they push apart. And it's kind of neat to feel that force field around them, keep trying to keep them apart. But if they're not that strong, you can force them together. Likewise with this, you can force that phosphate up and form a bond here. So you can go from ADP and phosphate to ATP. But just, just in the same way that you could get those two magnets, push them together and tie them together with a string and hold them there. You could do that, but what happens if you cut that string? That third mag that other magnet's gonna go fling and fly away. There's a force there that's gonna push it away. Likewise, cut that bond and that phosphate has a strong tendency to get away from that, releasing energy. So breaking up adenosine triphosphate releases energy. And some carrier proteins are set up so that they can have one spot on them that can take an ATP and break it and then use that energy to push something across the membrane even in a direction it would not normally go. That's the idea of primary active transport. So the way I usually sketch that is if we imagine we're looking at a cell here, the cartoon I use for an active transporter is a circle. And there's one in particular, a very common one that we can talk about. This one I usually draw as a split circle because it is a co-transport, it's more than one thing. This protein is the sodium potassium ATPase. It goes by other names. You may have heard it called the sodium potassium pump or even the sodium potassium exchanger. I usually call it an ATP ACE. And so you know, ACE implies enzyme. So this implies that this is something which is an enzyme that can use ATP as its substrate. This protein can take ATP and turn it into ADP. and phosphate. And it can use the energy from that to move three sodium ions out of the cell in exchange for two potassium ions into the cell. And it can do that even if there's already a higher concentration of sodium outside or potassium inside. So this can move sodium out and potassium in against their concentration gradient. Now take a look. What kind of carrier is that? First of all, uniport or co-transport. It's moving two things, so it's a co-transport. Symport or antiport. It's moving them in opposite directions, so it's an antiport. And this is an active antiport. It can use ATP to force this to happen. So this can push sodium out of the cell, even if diffusion would make sodium go in. That's an example of a primary active transport. Energy is being used at the place where the transport is happening. That's relatively simple. And there are many different versions of these. You'll see them as we go. But now let's talk about secondary active transport. Secondary active transport is a little more subtle. In secondary active transport, you're going to cause active transport across a membrane without using energy at the place where the transport is occurring. And one common example of this is a protein that you've heard mentioned briefly, which is the SGLT, sodium glucose 
luminal transport. You may remember that this is a protein which can move sodium and glucose across the membrane, but only if they move in the same direction. Notice I've drawn it as a rectangle. That means it's a passive carrier. And it theoretically can work in either direction. But this is, let's talk about how this works, for example, in the digestive tract. We've got, actually, no, let's talk about it in the kidneys. It's a little easier there. So I've got glucose out here. But I've actually got a slightly larger concentration of glucose in here. Notice I've written it a little bigger. So if the concentration of glucose here is higher than here, which way would glucose tend to go by diffusion? Diffusion always goes high to low. So if I've got these two things set up, the glucose would tend to overall move here to here. But we don't want it to do that. I want to move this glucose to here. But there's already a higher concentration there, which means I cannot rely on diffusion to do it. If I just put a glucose transporter here, it's not going to go that way overall. So I put in an SGLT. Now, the SGLT doesn't use ATP. It's not an active transporter. But what I'm going to do is put a sodium potassium pump here. It's going to move the potassium in in exchange for the sodium out. Don't worry about what happens to the potassium. By moving the potassium out, I make sure that the concentration of sodium in here is very low, whereas the concentration out here is quite a bit higher. So I'm running this pump. That's a primary active transport to make sure that the concentration of sodium in here stays very, very low. Now, let's think about what's going to happen at the SGLT. This works when a sodium and a glucose both arrive on the same side of the transporter at the same time. So if a sodium and a glucose both bump into this side together, they'll move out. If they both bump into this side together, they'll move in. Which side is more likely to get a glucose bumping into it? Well, if the concentration is higher in here than here, then this side's a little more likely to have glucose arrive at any given moment. Which side is more likely to have sodium bump into it? That's out here, and significantly, because the concentration of sodium in here is very small. It's rare for a sodium to bump into this side. So which side is more likely to get a sodium and a glucose to bump into it at the same time? Well, even though this side's a little more likely to get a glucose than this side, this side's a lot more likely to get a sodium. So the chance of getting a sodium and a glucose together is higher out here. And since they go together, that means that most of the movement of sodium and glucose will be inward, even though glucose is going against its concentration gradient. That means that this is active transport of glucose, which means energy must be being used, but it's not being used here. Where is it being used? Here, at this primary active transport. By using ATP here to pump the sodium out, we're setting this up so that most of the sodium and glucose will be coming in. You're using the energy here to create a situation, this low sodium concentration, which will cause glucose to come in. One way to think about this is to say we've made it so that sodium wants to come in so much that it makes the glucose come with it. It wants to go in more than the glucose wants to go out, so it forces the glucose to come. You could think of it that way. It's not strictly speaking accurate, but it leads you to the right idea. Another way to prove this to yourself would be to imagine, what if we didn't have this? Well, then sodium would be coming in. Now remember, this is just we're making this up. Sodium would be coming in until the concentration of sodium in here matched out there. That's what diffusion would do. Now in that case, sodium is equally likely to be on either side but glucose is more likely to be here than here, so you're more likely to get glucose and sodium together here, which means the glucose will tend to go out slightly. So the only way that glucose can be coming in is if this is very low, and the only reason that's low is because we're running this pump. So the energy being used here sets this up. That also means that a concentration gradient like this is a form of stored energy. 
you can use that to do something, like pull glucose in against its concentration gradient. Just some things to think about. I wanted to make sure you saw the idea of secondary active transport because it's used at many places in the body and it's kind of a tricky idea. So now you've learned about primary and secondary active transport mechanisms. The other things we're going to be talking about during, during this lecture are types of receptors, different kinds of cell communication, and then at the very end, we're going to talk a little bit about membrane potential. So in the second part of this lecture, I'm going to be talking about types of receptors and we'll also include cell communication during that part. We'll leave membrane potential to the third part because that's a little longer. All right, I'll see you in just a moment.